There is so much beauty to be seen in creation, coupled with there is an end to all things. It puts into perspective stuff that I should be appreciating. And at this point in my life, none of it has anything to do with anything material. Football season is right around the corner. Y'all already know, Better is the best fantasy app out there with all the craziest payouts. 1,000x lineups are unbeatable. Turn $50 into $50,000 and win big with better picks now. Big news, we are adding college football this season. And y'all already know, I'm adding Penn State into every single one of my lineups. Drew Aller's about to light it up. It's super simple to use. So go download better, play better picks, and use code BO now. All right, welcome back to Nickels and Dimes, everybody. As you can see, we are not in the studio. Um, we are in Colorado currently, back to the place in which I came from, the place in which I was born. And uh, we have a guest, as you can see as well. Today we're here with my Uncle Mike. He's uh, one of the people that I've probably known the longest on this earth. I would say it's my parents and then probably you and Tina. So known forever. And uh, we've been hunting buddies the last few years and gone on a bunch of adventures. And you've gone on a lot of adventures yourself, outdoors adventures and such. And uh, this guy's got some of the best stories that I've ever heard, frankly. I appreciate you saying that. And, uh, yeah, we're excited to just chat it up and, yeah. So, we're here in Colorado to hunt some, hang out some, be outside some, see if we see any uh, deer, any elk, and uh, today was kind of the first day of scouting, so how do we think it went? It was a little tough. Yeah. Yeah, the, we need the weather to cool off a little bit. It'd be nice if we could get some rain, but it's uh, it's like it always is, though. Right. It usually yeah. takes us about a week to get in the swing of things. Yeah. Yeah. Try and keep, like, the mic. Fist like, from your fist, face? Yeah, fist from your face. That's really close. Ronan. Yeah. <laughs> Ronan likes the mic real close to his face, like well, almost in his mouth. <laughs> I got it. It just makes him comfortable <laughs> <laughs> for some reason. I, I'm not saying anything. I'm just yeah, saying it's There right. was a twinkle in your eye there for a moment. Yeah. Yeah, he's, it's like in a, a natural position for him. You know what I get called out for a lot in the YouTube comments is my shorts. So they're too short. They're looking at too much of my thigh. I can see your moose knuckle. <laughs> I was going to say, listen, I'm all about the shorts, right? I was showing off my Chaco tans. I mm-hmm. wear shorts, but that must, it's a, is it a swimmer thing? <laughs> 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 oh, man. So, Uncle Mike, tell the, our viewers kind of uh, some of your history, I guess, with um, your experience with the outdoors and hunting and what you've done with Division of Wildlife, and just kind of like how you got to where you are a little bit. I appreciate would, that. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, um, Give a little intro. No, so I guess um, f- personally, I was sort of kind of driven to hunt, um, t- really to help supplement um, food for my family. Right. right. Um, 31-year-old daughter, 28-year-old daughter uh, now, um, and uh, just of a generation that uh, – um, really um, was involved with hunting in this community, right? And then, of course, it's something that's been part of my family history. Um, and, um, yeah, so sort of kind of born out of hunger, really, hunting. I uh, learned it from my father. And as um, time passed and I grew up, I really uh, loved the outdoors. And I don't love I, – I, how do I say this? I don't enjoy and have never enjoyed ending – any of the things I've harvested life mm-hmm. that if hopefully that makes sense. I don't yep. like the killing part of it. It does. Um, but the, the amount of time in God's creation in the woods, uh, honing that skill and literally just spending time in creation. I don't know that there's anything that brings me more joy. Mm. Right. So um, what was, it sort of flowed into that, that mindset and that love and passion flowed into um, some opportunities uh, to get into habitat work, uh, some of which I've done for oil companies, for offset mitigation, um, working with the Division of Wildlife, uh, some private landowners. Like some of it was pi- uh, private money. Some of it was public money, right, mm-hmm. grants and, and like. And, uh, yeah, and I think because, right, as with anything you have a passion for, 
at least for me, I should just speak for me, my mind was a little bit more open to understanding my shortcomings with environmental restoration, reclamation. So it was, I wasn't forced to want to garner more uh, knowledge. It was uh, because I wanted to make money. It was like, it was a passion. Uh, it was a passion. Right. Right. I was like, wow, I really enjoy, uh, I really enjoy working with soils and, and growing habitat and then, and seeing how all these animals benefit from that because I'm not telling you anything, right? You get around. Yep. Uh, we, we build a lot of houses anymore. We build highways, right? We, we've screwed up a lot of migration routes and a lot, I don't want to get in the weeds on this, but so it's, we've done a lot of things to offset how things flowed. Mm. Right. Yeah. So at least for my own little personal journey in life, I get a lot of really cool feelings as a sense of uh, accomplishment doing my part. I, I, I guess, I guess to sum it up, I want to feel like when I get too old to hunt, I gave more than I took. Mm. Right. I gave back more than I took. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And that's, I think a mindset that when somebody thinks of a hunter, they don't think of that. And when somebody thinks of, um, I think a lot of hunters don't think that way. And so it's very unique, but I also feel like for me getting to learn from you and see that firsthand, it's given me a good foundation to understand what hunting's about and what that lifestyle is about and how to be a good steward of all of the the gifts that God provides. Well said. Mm -hmm. No, and sure. you come from good stock. Yeah. I've known your daddy for <laughs> 34, 35 years. Right. And yeah, did, I think, listen, I think it, it helps, right? It's not like you, I mean, you could probably come from some really screwed up beginnings mm -hmm. and get with the right individuals and sort of find your way, right? We see that a lot, right? Yeah. You, you know a lot of people, and I know a lot of people. I've seen guys that came from really bad situations, and they didn't use it as an excuse to just continue down that bad road. They broke that cycle. But I guess more to the point, you're, you started from a really good foundation. You had a very good man that started you out on every aspect of life, from not just morally how you handle yourself with integrity when nobody's around are going to know, your dad's always been a wicked cool dude, man, about how you should treat, uh, you treat others as though you, how you would want to be treated. Mm -hmm. You, you, you grew up in that and, uh, and it, and it works for you, right? right? You're not faking it. So I think that's helped. That yeah. helps. That helps if you can start off on that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's cool to think about where you began and where you're at now. And I think a lot of people maybe neglect doing that. And uh, whether it was from, you know, like you said, a bad place or a really great place, but I think reflecting on that and then wanting to improve and grow and get better and move forward is such a powerful thing. Like even that conversation we had earlier today about, you know, when we were in the car, just like kind of your perspective, I guess it's a, uh, it's a cool thing. Yeah. I if I, I want to say something that's, you got me thinking about something. You know, I've watched, I've watched your uh, development as, an, as a man, mm -hmm. right? And I can see these things in, in, in the world around you that I could absolutely had a, have a negative effect on you. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is like pride, Right. You, I could see that. Right. You are an accomplished man. You hang out with accomplished individuals, man. And I mean, your wife is like just amazing. Right. On all levels. Mm -hmm. And as a mom, as an individual, as an athlete, um, wicked smart. So it would be really easy for you to get intoxicated by the smell of your own perfume. Right. Right. And I think one of the biggest benefits that man or woman can garner from time in the woods and, I, and, not, and I'm not even going to correlate it to, to harvesting an animal, is there is so much beauty to be seen in creation coupled with the absolute brutality mm. of nature itself. Yeah. 
right? And I, and and I'm saying that because it puts things into perspective, right? And I think if you keep yourself in the context of our creation, civilization, mm-hmm. and I'm not trying to oversimplify this, I think that it's it's pretty easy to start just going down this road. Of, I got all that, and I'm cool, and everybody loves me. And man, you step out in the world into the into the creation, and you find out real quick you're just part of the ecosystem, dude. Right. And there's no mercy any more for you than anything else out there. Yeah. I think if you if you have a perspective, just a I think a healthy perspective of life in general, and you have gratitude and you see things for what they are in a somewhat accurate way. And then you go hunt and you experience what it's like to at in the in a basic level, like take a life, like and you come at it from a, a place again of harvesting that animal and making good use of what that animal is, you know, again a, a something that God is providing us and that makes you, you can't help but, basically, you can't help but realize how small you are and how the nature really doesn't give a rip. And you you have to come face to face with that and acknowledge that. And I think people maybe, I, I don't think that goes for people that do it for the wrong reasons. The bloodthirsty people, the people that maybe give hunting a bad rap who are a little more egotistical, but... I think when you can check the ego at the door, and I think that hunting make also and being spending time in nature also kind of, to in a sense, forces you to do that to check your ego because you're gonna fail a lot. <laughs> that you just have to kind of gain perspective, as you mentioned, Absolutely. and it's a really really powerful thing. And I think it's given me a better perspective of life in general, and and again myself and realizing the small, small part of everything that I play and it, and it, and it can definitely just humble you a lot. There's a lot of, a lot of humility, humility. Yeah. Not, I don't want to go to a dark place, but I think, and especially as I'm older, right? I'm 53 years old now, right? Every individual man or woman gets to a point in age where you start going, wow, (laughs) There's a lot more in the rearview mirror than ahead of me. Right. And I think, so things that he, create humility can change. Like, so like right now you're a daddy. Mm. Unbelievable chunk of humble pie. Right? Right. But there's going to be other things that are going to change, right? And that, and that's your journey. But I think at the end of all things, all of us start to get to a point, unless you're just completely asleep at the wheel, you come to a realization that there is an end to your little game Mm. and there's no games out there. Yep. Right. I mean, it's, you know, you see these things in on TV and that, you know, national geographic and all this stuff. And it's horribly brutal out there. And I, for me, like I said, I don't want to get dark is it really puts a perspective in there is a there is an end to all things, and it makes me very, um, it puts into perspective stuff that I should be appreciating, mm. and and at this point in my life, none of it has anything to do with anything material, because it's, I've seen enough folks cross the Rainbow Bridge, and animals as well, and you ain't taking nothing with you. The only thing you've got in this world that's of any value are the people that you love, and the people that love you. And trying to be a good individual. And the only way to be a good individual, you get, you're going to get this, right? Just through all of those things build that foundation of going, I just want to be treated with love and respect. And so does my fellow man. Mm. And I just need to simplify things. It's pretty simple out there, right? It's yeah. life and death. Yeah, that's it. It's- yeah, I was going to say that was like the first thing I noticed when I came here. And I think I said last night, I was like, everything just seems so simple, completely dark out, couldn't even see anything, wake up this morning, like everything just seems so simple. And I think that when you simplify things, your head becomes more quiet. And I think when you're 
out and about like where we're from in like Pennsylvania or just like in the, I want to say the real world, but in the world that we've made the up. hustle and bustle. Yeah, the, the hustle, hustle and bustle, bustle of the real well world. Said. Everything gets super complex in your head and then you're worried about this and then you're worried about this person that you've never even met before and then that gets like, that's why people have anxiety. Right. Not to nowadays. mention that within the hustle and bustle, what's promoted lifestyle-wise is poor crappy diet <laughs> and adding in whatever drugs or whatever uppers or downers that you can get your hands on and no sleep and everything's blue light and everything's the opposite of what it's supposed to be to be a really healthy person. Whereas out here, I feel like, you know, it's funny. My manager was asking me the other day um, because I have a fight coming up and he was like, like when you go out to like hunt, like what's it like? Like how's your shape when you come back? I'm like, dude, I come back ready to rock because I'm up at five, six in the morning. I'm on my feet all day. We're running around. We're doing our thing. I get to bed when it basically when it starts to get dark, you know, maybe we have, we talk a little bit or this or that, but you know, I'm getting to bed early and I sleep like a baby Mm -hmm. because it's just different out here. The, the peacefulness and the, the rest is, is very real. And then, you know, it's back at it again the next day and I'm just, present and focused and i'm eating clean and we're doing our thing there's you know no distractions but like when i come back from a hunt i'm in i'm like dialed and my energy and my everything that's going on is like very laser focused Mm -hmm. it's it's because i spent all this time out in the woods and i'm focused on this one task and goal and it, it just translates so well so I'd have no worries. Like I'll, I think I could take off a month, and it just if I just spent it in the mountains, and I'd come back even more dialed. Yeah, than you're what an I, animal. Yeah, than what it would be. You said something that was really cool. Is like all the distractions go away. Really, it, it simplifies, right? Yeah. I think the one thing that really, um, I just, I I feel bad about for your generation. Like we're living in the most unbelievable technological era in human history, right? And it's coupled with like some really jacked up stuff too. Like your guys, this whole generation is promoting this. How do I say this? Like better than the next guy kind of Mm. uh, goal, right? Everything you do is like, you're a tech guy, right? So you're continually being compared to all these other tech guys. And you have access to see every wicked cool thing they do. Right. And it's there's a lot of anxiety in that, right? It's like you never get to rest. You can't ever simplify, right? Because the hustle and bustle of you guys' lifestyle is a hundredfold crazier than mine was, right? Mm. Yeah. It's and, and so that's the thing that I actually what I love as much as hunting anymore is I absolutely freaking love getting around you young Thundercats and watching you decompress. Mm. Yeah. I love it. I think it's fantastic. And if you, if I get to be a part of that and share that with you guys, I'm winning. Definitely. Well, yeah. I think that's a big problem with today is because now everyone's focused on everyone else. And when you're focused on everyone else, you yourself will never achieve what you want to achieve. And that's Amen. just how it goes. Because you can, when you're actually focused on yourself, not worried about what everyone else is doing, like then you can actually like grind. And then you can actually focus on what you want to get good at. Um, because if you just keep worrying about everyone else, like you're never going to get anywhere because in your own head, you're not even right. sane. And you, you never ask yourself the question of where am I going? And, and you never, you never deal with internal conflict. You're always dealing with external conflict and you're also never getting internal reward. You're always, any reward you get is purely external, which the value there is just very fleeting and you know internal reward is truly is truly like the reward that's that's valuable like when you're doing something out of genuine love and appreciation and gratitude that's something that like if you accomplish a goal you can kind of actually get real good feelings about oh dude but when you accomplish a goal that's just been external it's like very vapid and empty and and it, like i said fleeting <clears throat> yeah yeah well, I, sorry. Go ahead. You got no. I was just gonna say, if it's born through self reflection, mm. it's growth, man. Yep, I love that. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a, 
that's a big part of like this podcast that we're trying to promote and push is how do people grow and improve and I guess I don't want to sound like like a weird hippie but like self actualize like get the most out of their their self and and not in ways that are worldly in like real genuine genuine ways oh. and uh, being out in the woods would I'm confident help anyone yeah yeah I don't uh yeah I want to change directions slightly um talk to me a little bit about 70 outfitters you know the kind of genesis of it how it began because I actually don't know this like what motivated you to want to start uh guiding hunters and specifically guiding for upland birds like what's so fun for you about that and 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 t- just give us a little intro on t- on 7T and what it is yeah no that's a great that's actually a really cool question <clears throat> and it's really uh it's good stuff to think about i would say that um as i said earlier i really enjoy spending time with folks that are sort of looking for a little bit more out of life right even though that even though that's simplicity right it's it's more it's more mm-hmm. than what the world's offering us and again as i've gotten older and i've grown in hunting and become very proficient at it i very much enjoy sharing what it is that i know the good things and more importantly the bad things right things to just try to avoid and um so a lot of it started out of that. I've been blessed in my life. I started guiding for my wife's dad, like as a side hustle. Jeez, man, when I was in my early 20s. And, I, and it, it was fun. Mm-hmm. Just enjoyed hanging with people. I'm right. like you. I love visiting with people, hanging out. You know what I mean? Just loving life and loving people. Mm-hmm. And so that sort of started that. And then again, let's be truthful, dude. I was raising a family in a tough part of the country, right? I mean... Everything growing up was you worked through the summer and you usually got laid off in construction in the winter. So you had to make ends meet, right? Right. So you got some money from guiding and you got some groceries from harvest. So that really started it. And then as it developed, I, I, as I got better with it, there was some decent money to be made, right? And so that sort of drove that. And I, I guess to sort of cut that off. I don't want to go down that road too far. Mm-hmm. I don't really enjoy it as much anymore because, and I, and listen, I hope I don't get destroyed for saying this. I think as much as I like social media and all the things that you can garner from it, it is turned into such a horrible thing for hunting. Right. Because you know that everything that's getting posted has been edited. Right. I hang around you freaking dudes. I see all the hard work that goes into making it. makes me look, look good. Right. I mean, that means anything's possible. Hardest job makes on earth. Everything look like, dude, that guy's a ninja. <laughs> yeah. But I guess what the, the bad thing of it is, is the expectations now oh, because of social media. Insane. I don't enjoy it anymore. Like, yeah. it's like we were joking around today when you were joking around with that guy in New Mexico. He's like, yeah, yeah. So, Bo, what do you want to do? And you're like, nah, I don't, what do you want? He says, what do you want for a bull? And you were like, mm, no, nothing crazy. Just 380, 390. Like, <laughs> yeah. No. And you were joking. Yeah. The unfortunate flip side of that is I get that from knuckleheads. They're like, I want a 200 inch deer. You're like, dude, you realize what you just said? I don't care what you saw on Instagram. You're like, yeah, me too, bud. Yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) spend the next 10 years with me on my lookout. Yeah. Yeah. You you want a 200 inch deer? Why don't you go down to a high fence ranch, then pay $40,000? Yeah. And you can do it. And it's It's just, just, yeah, it's just too stressful for me. It's not real, though. It's not real. And I don't, whatever. The Upland thing is totally born out of my love for dogs, Mm. right? It's just amazing watching an animal work. And listen, if you're a dog guy or dog woman, you get it. Right. There's a relationship that goes on there, whether it's a lab or a beagle or even just a lap dog. Mm -hmm. That's, it's like a little symbiotic relationship. If you, I I guess that's the right way to say it, right? Yeah. Um, you're working with each other. Yeah. It's your hunting buddy. You both benefit, and it's just a great partnership. Yeah. So that, foundationally, is everything I've built the Upland stuff off of. It is the relationship with the dog, yeah. and I thoroughly enjoy watching people with their dogs. Right. The joy that it brings people. And, and I, I think we also have a lot of people that listen to this podcast that probably know zero about hunting, know zero about anything. So just explain them real quick what what Upland game bird hunting is. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so Upland game hunting is hunting for various 
upland game bird species. Those birds can be grouse, they can be pheasants, they can be quail, um, you know, sage grouse, mm-hmm. um, all those all those types of fowl. Right. And there's multiple ways to hunt them from just getting out there on your own and looking at some really cool maps and 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 hunting them, right? Like you would Easter egg hunting. Mm-hmm. Right? Everybody's hunted Easter eggs. That's right. what you're doing. What what we do when we go Easter egg hunting for pheasants or quail or what have you is we do that with our dog because our dog has like way better lungs than us. He's got way better eyes and ears, but more importantly, he's got a sense of smell that blows ours out of the water. Mm. And you build these relationships through training and also a love, right? There's nothing more important than a boy and his dog or a girl and their dog. Right. So they, as that thing evolves, right? That relationship, Mm -hmm. I hate to use that word with that animal. Um, they're really working for you too because they're enjoying your mm-hmm. happiness. They can sense right. that in you. So we go out and we look for these animals and we hunt with German shorthair pointers. And it's it's a manner in which we like to hunt. These dogs work with us. They go out. They literally locate a, a bird that's holding in cover. Right. And they point it. like Not like this, but with their nose and they get in a certain body posture. And then what I also like about it is it's super safe because our dogs are trained to hold and they won't move and we whether it's me hunting or one of my clients we walk those people up in front of the dog and have them literally flush the bird which means they it's hiding right and when they get up upon it the bird's like oh i gotta get out of town it rises you harvest the animal Mm -hmm. and then at that point you release your dog right to bring it back bring it back yeah yeah you're shooting you know generally over under shotguns yep couple shells at a time, you know, and uh, it's the freaking coolest thing in the world. There's it nothing is. like having your dog point a bird, walking up to it, flushing the bird, shooting the bird, and then your dog bringing it back to you. It's, there's nothing like it. Nothing like it. It is the best feeling. No, and you said something today that was really cool. It's in the, you're doing all this and it's really slow. Like it's, I shouldn't say slow, but it's like, it's kind of controlled, right? It's not like when you're hunting an elk and you're like oh, yeah. going crazy. This thing got up. It's, and- it's the word I would use to describe it. While it's active, it's leisurely. Yeah. It's well like, said. it's like I always, com- this is what I compare it to for people that have never hunted or never upland bird hunted. It's the hunting equivalent. If hunting was sports, upland bird is golf. Oh, wow. Because, <laughs> you know, you hit your shot. I love it. Or like, you know, you, you, you set up whatever, blah, blah, blah. You hit your golf shot. Oh, great. Perfect shot. That's the same equivalent to your dog pointing, f- flushing the bird, shooting the bird, and getting it brought back to you. Like hitting a good golf shot is kind of similar to that. Uh, for me personally, the, the upland bird hunting is way more rewarding and way more fun. But it is the same. It's a similar feeling to hitting like a Makes beautiful sense. golf shot. Yeah, and then you do it again, and then guess what? Now we're gonna keep looking, and we're gonna do it again. Yeah. Um, big game hunting is like an MMA fight. Like if I'm hunting an elk, that's a that's a lot, and yeah. I got to dial in, and I might spend, you know, a whole month trying to get a specific elk, and I might have one opportunity to harvest that animal. Yeah. And it's just a lot of pressure. Yeah. And so they're very different. Well, but they both like have, you know, cool value and reward in their own way. Yep. And not that deer and elk. And so to get back to the question you asked is why. Right. The, the, so the upland bird thing, obviously I said the, the dog thing, mm-hmm. but I raised daughters. And although there is some amazing women that hunt all sorts of big game, a lot, right? Probably arguably more women hunt big game now than in y'all's generation than in mine. And I, maybe that's not true, but it seems like it is. Maybe that's social media guiding my thoughts on I would that. I say it does seem that way. It yeah. does seem that way. But I will say that the thing I love about Upland Game Bird hun- hunting is there's a lot of ladies that are in it, man, mm. and children. And I love that. I love getting people into the outdoor uh, sports. And Upland Bird hunting flows really well with ladies. Right. You know what I mean? Because it's... Yeah. And the other thing that's cool about it, too, that I really like that... The upland game bird, uh, what would I say? This like the supply industry, like the folks that make guns and make clothing, have done a. F- they're they're doing. They I think they still need to do a better job. They're literally going out of their way to make clothes for women, mm. right? Because 
they're, they're, they 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 have different you know women have different needs right right not all women but you know some women have different needs of what they expect out of gear or how it fits yeah right and and that's a cool thing about yeah. upland game bird hunting. <laughs> you're what are you trying say? to say, Uncle Mike? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're getting some... in, you're getting in the weeds a little bit. About to, yeah, sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> but, like, no, I just was laughing. <laughs> I could tell. I was. I felt like I was getting close to falling off. The I cliff felt like there was a missed opportunity for a joke there, uh-huh. but I could. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. So there's that, and then yeah. and then the biggest thing about it, and is the. I absolutely love the habitat side of upland stuff. And and to put it as simple as I can and as fast as I can, what's really cool about the habitat for upland game birds is that if it's done correctly, every species up the food chain gets to benefit from it. Right. Like, so if you build this food plot for a deer, mm-hmm. great. That's fantastic. There's nothing wrong with it. All the power to you. But in doing so, is there anything really in that food plot that's going to be a benefit to all the other animals that are in that environment? Right. Maybe. Probably more often than not, no. Right? Because the guy's like really focused on... It's exclusively benefiting the deer. Yeah. But if you do the right type of habitat for upland game birds, the deer can eat it. Yep. The elk can eat it. The coyotes can hunt it. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything about it is sort of kind of foundational. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Real quick, talk to me and uh, Ronan about the new addition to the, uh, I'll say, to your lifestyle, that being the Gator Pump. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Yeah. I can't. I know. I rambled about that like a, a, a knucklehead. I got like, to see it in action today, which yeah, is cool. Yeah, Gator Pump. Though Everybody about... Everything about Gator Pump is incredible. So real quick, Gator Pump is essentially a pump that is going to move water from one place to another, and it's going to make it super easy. And uh, they're an amazing company that we've been fortunate to be able to work with, and it's really taken the habitat to a new level. Like, Absolutely. I've, I mean, I'm, I've been here the last few years, and seeing what the habitat looks like now, it's like, it's honestly pretty unreal, especially in one year. Yeah. Months yeah. months worth of using it, it's like a different place. Yeah, diametrically different environment that would take years to develop without that. And right. uh, and listen, there's a lot of things I can ramble off about. First and foremost, they're, they're a veteran-owned company. Mm-hmm. They have been in business in the United States for 50-some-odd years. They build their pumps one at a time. They, like, hands-on, custom fit to your needs. Mm. So... I like everything about it is so, I know this is going to, I hope this sounds, it's just American, man. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's like, you can get on the phone with these yeah. dudes and talk to the owners, like talk to the, to, to everybody in that company. Yeah. And more importantly, boots on the ground. You can move more water and take care of more needs when you have water available, which is a very short amount of time in the West mm-hmm. for the least amount of energy with the least amount of energy. Right. Right. So efficient. So efficient. Yeah. It's it's incredible, and like I said, I, the biggest benefit of it is they are just amazing people to work with. Yeah, they've just jumped over good people. A, yeah, good people. And you said that we were moving over a thousand gallons of water an hour, a minute. Oh, a minute. Excuse me, a thousand over a thousand gallons of water a minute. You could do that for ten straight hours and use how many gallons of fuel? Seven. Seven gallons of fuel. That Seven. just doesn't seem real, but it is real. It is real. I, we saw it. We saw it in action today. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you just, and it's really cool because the one we got has a meter on it. Yeah. So you can, you can tie that in with what your water ride is and yeah. you're not doing anything more than you're allowed. Right. Right. Based on your water right. But you get, you can move your given water right yeah. with ease and efficiency. And that's huge, man. Because fuel, as everybody knows. Yeah. It's freaking expensive. It sucks. Yeah, it sucks. No, I just thought that was so cool. It's like, that's like just an absolute game changer. It's, it's something that, you know, there's, it's nice to get certain things that's like a little like luxury, but that's like a, as you said, it's a diametric change in the way that things are operating. Yeah. Yeah. I think you should talk about how you compared like our blood uh, to like the water of mother nature. 
Oh yeah. Like, like I think that's like I don't think people realize that of how important. Like obviously, yeah. like we know the water's important. Like we have to drink it all the time. No, but and like, and you guys live in an unbelievably lush environment, right? Mm-hmm. The East Coast, yeah, right? right? So you guys got water. Out west here, whether you want to correlate environmental change to man or just a cyclical thing that's taken place since the beginning of the history of the earth, water in and of itself is a very limited resource, right? And when you live around the need for water and the benefits of water like we do out here in the West, the way I just, the only way I love to wrap my brain around it, it is the lifeblood of the earth. Mm. Everything, right, you can make it without a whole lot of different things that are in the environment, right? You don't need mountains. You don't need a desert. You don't need, you know, the East Coast. But every single environment on planet Earth lives or dies based on that foundational truth of water is the blood of, of this planet. Mm. So you got to respect it. You need to capitalize on it to the, to the, to the best of your ability. And my, and it's extremely important to me. And I know it is to you, man. We've been working on this gator pump thing for a long time with Kai and Riley, man. We've been on it a while is you, you're doing the best you can with your resource. Mm. And that's great. Right. Right. So not only are you winning and reaching your goals, but you go to bed at night going, hey, I'm not wasting anything. And I'm not burning copious amounts of freaking fuel to move my water to grow habitat, that, mm-hmm. whether it's hay or habitat. Right. For animals. Right. So, yeah, that's uh, I'm, that's funny you brought that up. I, it was neat talking to you about that, man. Yeah. Yeah. That really resonated with me because I don't think that people realize that of how important it is for like yeah. water to like like you were saying, the with the one food crop that you were growing um, for the deer, and that's where they, they all sit and they like it because it's covered. Like if that's not there, there's probably not that as many deer there. No. And then it like whole ecosystem changes. Yeah. Not as many deer, like a bunch of other things lead to one thing to another, and like there's a huge chain reaction with that yeah. too. Yeah, and, and it's all born of the responsibility we have, right? Right. Yeah, like, and, and I'm not saying my responsibility is of more important th- importance than a guy that lives in Manhattan. Right, but there's things that that he's that he's responsible for. He may not want to shirk those tasks, mm-hmm. but that's just life, man. Right, you can try to get around that and shirk that task, and you're going to suffer. Not just the environment that you were given to take care of, mm-hmm. right? When you were born on this earth, yeah, right. You, and, and listen, I'm not trying to throw anybody than the bus. We've all lived long enough and traveled enough. You you can't shirk that task because if you do, you suffer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just think it gave me a whole new appreciation for it. I'm glad that makes like, me happy. Yeah, definitely coming out here just for like a little bit. Yeah, so much different. Have what? you ever been out west? No, he's been. I mean, not not to, not to the. He's been to Vegas, like the, the cities. But yeah, I, I, went, I went to yeah. South Dakota with you. But oh yeah, he was in yeah, South yeah, Dakota. Yeah, yeah. But oh, yeah. that's but that's the, a, not a real place. It was also so yeah. Where, <laughs> yeah that was where, amazing. Yeah, where, that where we is, were, I was like, unreal. when you said that this is my because that was also my first time going hunting. My idea of like, oh, we are going to be deep in the woods, like going after something. I didn't yeah. know we were hunting birds. Well, that, that's just like, that's, that's fun. That's like different, you know. That's like, since that was your first experience, it's a really weird place to start off because most people don't go to 5,000 acre upland game bird ranches that are maintained better than a golf course. Oh, like, totally. And, insane. And who have you know, 35,000 plus birds on, on that land. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a little different. It's heaven. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think Ronan? Like, what else do you think have you learned? I mean, you only been here a day, but I want to hear from your perspective, what you think about like just the experience overall. I, I just, I think that it really comes down to it being way more simple out here because, which I like a lot because this has probably been the only day in the past three months, I've been on my phone less than an hour. Like, I love that. Which is crazy. To me, like, being, like, in the industry that I'm in and doing what I'm doing, like, being on my phone, like, less than an hour is crazy amount. Like, I'm not worried about anything else. Like, the idea of, like, waking up in the morning, going and checking for, like, your meal or, like, going to check for what you're going to hunt, come back, eat some food, go back out. Like, I just think that's a very, very primal way to live. And like I've been saying, like it just makes everything more simple because you're focused on one task. You're not focused on 18 different things. Yeah. So yeah, I, I like that a lot. And then obviously just, Oh no, 
it's definitely like a completely different way of life that I never even like fathomed in my head. Yeah. What would you say? Did you have any misconceptions about what it's like out here before you came or things that kind of caught you off guard? I just think that like the sheer beauty of Colorado is definitely like very breathtaking. Last night we go outside um, and I look up and I've never seen stars like that. Mm -hmm. And that was like, that was a huge eye opener to me. And Mike pulls up out the like infrared scope and he's telling me to look up to the sky. I'm like, I didn't even know there was that many stars. Yeah. It's so much different. Um, so I think that like that really like opened my eyes and like, like we live in a beautiful place, right? Like Pennsylvania is great, but there's also like a whole other side of the rainbow that most people haven't discovered yet. Yeah. yeah. And that's like, that's out here. Totally different. Definitely. What'd you think the first time coming out here? For I you? was born out here. I know. But so. like when you were like yep. five, it wasn't the same. No, I mean, I didn't, I would say like, I spent a lot of time out here as a kid and we'd come back and visit and stuff like that. And so. I knew what it was like, um, but then I went a long stint of not being here. Like, I don't know, probably like 15 years of like time. not being out here. And uh, I think that the first time I came back when um, a few years ago when I wanted to hunt an elk and, uh, you know, came out here to hang out with my Uncle Mike and Aunt Tina, it really felt like I was coming home. I was like, wow. I felt very connected to the environment very connected to this place and it felt like it was like it, it was where I was supposed to be and every time I come back here it feels like I'm coming home and coming to a place that I'm that I just have a strong connection to where I'm just supposed to be here it's something weird about that for me at least like having moved around so much and lived in so many different places like coming back to where I was born and it just feels right and feels good, and um, I love it. I wish I could spend more time out here, and I think the older I get, the more time I will spend out here for sure. Oh, yeah, no, I, I have no doubt. You know, uh, what's really been fun with you, you and I have worked together on right. another project that's yeah. for a year. Yeah. And, and we know each other based on that. Which is totally awesome fun. I have been very anxious to get you out here. It's so much different. Yeah. Like, couldn't even tell you. I, I couldn't even, in my head, I couldn't even, like, picture what this was like. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah. Well, I wanted, I wanted, it, I wanted it to be, like, um, positive. I wanted it to be positive. Oh, yeah. Because, listen, brother, I'm not going to lie to you. We've been here in this, uh, here at the ranch for a while. And there's some folks that have come out and visited us. They don't like it. Right, they just they don't like the isolation, and them. like we don't live on the far side of the moon, right? I mean, no. I got neighbors, right? And but there's some folks that just don't like that. They don't like the, I don't. know, It's almost like lack of security, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I guess, I and mean, that's the only thing I could sort of associate. It feels it to. uncomfortable to them, yeah. for some reason, yeah, something. But <clears throat> no, I'm glad that you're enjoying yourself. It makes me happy. I, I and I'm not saying the where you live and what you do is bad, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just a different like appreciation for. Yeah. The land. Yeah. Because yeah. I feel like in, like, where I grew up and then going to state college, like, you don't really ever, like, I never thought twice about yeah. anything over there. It's just concrete and convenience, you know? Like, that's yeah. what I I think of, I guess, spending a lot of time out here the last few years when I'm back in in town or in a city. Everything's based off convenience. Everything's based off ease and making your life as easy and convenient as possible. Yeah. And I think that easy and convenient seems good, but it's actually like the worst thing for a lot of people. Yeah. And when you're out here, it's the only way c things can be easy and convenient is if you develop a system and make them that for yourself. <laughs> you got to, awesome. you got to make it convenient for you. And a lot of times still things aren't going to be convenient. Like you just got to work. It's still hard. Like, you, you know, I get, just talking with you and, and, and seeing what you're doing, once the springtime hits, it's it's work. You're getting after it every day, prepping, doing your things. You know, it's just stuff that most people don't have to deal with. Yeah, because of their lifestyle and where they live, it's. Uh, but I also think that 
it's just healthy to have inconvenience at certain times and to just be like, you know what, I got to get this done. And it's not a somewhat trivial, meaningless task for your job. It's like, I got to do this or like we're not going to make it type of thing. Like if I don't, I'm trying to think of a good example. It's like, like if, if, if I don't like prep, if or I guess this would be a good example. Like if I don't prep the habitat and if I'm not watering it and staying on track of it, it's going to be crap. Yeah, it's going to die. And, and then, and guess what? Now we have no opportunity for either harvesting animals or for business. Like it's done. It's that yeah. simple. Yeah. And that isn't, I, and I can't put that responsibility on anybody else. That's mine and my life. Right. And it's different when you're uh, working a job and it's like, all right, I don't do my assignment or that I was asked to do or I didn't do it. And it's like, okay, now maybe the business takes a little bit of a hit or, you know, something doesn't go well. It's like the consequences are just different. Because mm-hmm. you're dealing with living things. Yeah. Yeah, like it's not like, well, we didn't get the sidewalk job port, so we're, we're just going so we'll to have to. do it tomorrow. Yeah, we'll bump concrete to tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, well, the forms are going to stay there. The gravel is going to stay at grade. Right. Right. And And you know what? What's kind of funny about this whole conversation is, like, again, we're, we don't live in the wilds of Alaska, right? We're not right. carving our, our livelihood out of the forest, so to speak. But we we do the best we can to sort of be self-sufficient. Like mm-hmm. I've talked to you, we've got a garden, right? right? Yeah. we got water to water it, and we got a pond, and we can fish out of the river, and all these blah, 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 blah. But I think, um, you know, we lived, you know, Tina and I, we had, I was into the hustle and bustle in the, raking it in and the job and the construction and traveling and all that stuff. And it wasn't a, for me, my journey, no one else's journey. There were times I handled that really well, but there were times I wasn't very responsible with, with those gifts. Right. Um, I, I, I'm a very competitive guy, right? It's very easy for me to go to a, a place of pride, right? Or, and, I, and, and not in like, not, I don't even know how to say this other than we'll just leave it at that. Right. It's like, dude, I kicked everybody's butt around me. Like you don't, you can't do nothing. I just, I have a tendency to want to be very prideful in my accomplishments. The reason that this lifestyle has worked with me, Ronan is because it, again, it's humbling. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that like every, everyone needs to do tough things because it's like the opposite of what's I don't want to say like pushed on to people, but I feel like that is kind of true. Like everyone, we were talking about like uh, motherly love and like what that looks like for some people. Like I know me, like I was coddled. I was, I'm an only child. Like I'm a mom's baby, you know, like a lot of motherly love there. Like, but there's also times of everyone's life where they go through tough things and like, that's what makes them, you know, grow as a person and everything. Mm -hmm. But it's a different kind of tough when it's like you working out in the field like you having to like prep this food, like prep a habitat because like without this, like you are not going to make it. That's like a different kind of sense that I think we all have as humans that we've kind of lost along the way. Yeah. Yeah. No, if it, if I don't do my job, if I don't take care of my responsibilities correctly and ironically enough, some of the other work that I do as a contractor is of proper of the property management type of a, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm responsible for those people's property as well. So right. if I don't do my job in that context, I got to go find another job, man. I'm going to end up going to a big town. I'm going to have to go somewhere right. and, you know, do something that I just don't know that's very healthy for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Sweet. Yeah, well, um, we definitely appreciate the knowledge, the wisdom. This has been one of my favorite podcasts we've this done. This has also been one of my favorite podcasts yeah, we've done. this was great. And, uh, yeah, hopefully this motivates people to like, not necessarily, you know, they don't have to upend their whole life and change their whole lifestyle, but just to have, be open and see a different perspective and kind of maybe, uh, get interested in some things in the outdoors. I feel like that would be a massive, massive win. And, you know, I think that in turn, that's going to build a lot of resilience and, uh, cause a lot of growth in people and, you know. It's always good just to have different perspectives and see different things. So appreciate your time, Uncle Mike. And I'm Absolutely. pumped for this next, you know, little bit we have together. Me have too. a good time.
glad you guys are here. Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, it means course. a lot to me. I appreciate you both. All right. Yeah. Um, I guess to close, uh, I would, I guess the only thing that people need to check out and follow 70 outfitters on Instagram, uh, you post a lot of updates and cool content on that, that page, wildlife content, habitat content, upland game, bird hunting, different stuff, some dogs, dogs, German short hair pointers stuff. Um, all really cool stuff. And, uh, can I say something really quick? Absolutely. Go ahead. And I hope this is okay to say. For sure. We're also very proud that you're a, a partner with us. Yeah. A business partner with, with me and Tina. Mm-hmm. You're an owner in this, man. And I'm so happy and proud of that. Yeah. It means a lot to me to do that with you. It means a lot to me, too. You know, to be, um, you know, partner and, and part owner in a, in a legit certified licensed outfitting business in the state of Colorado, of which I was born, that's like a dream. For me and it's such a it's it's honestly out of i'm involved in a lot of businesses i love them all they're all great great people but i would say that this is what i'm most proud of and what i feel the best about and what i identify with in the most real way i love that so i i would never even be close to being able to do that without you so i appreciate you, uncle mike enough said thank you all right all right bye everybody thank you Thank you. Peace.